Um, so for our next session, we have Tim Stanley um, and Erica Wayne, if you guys could come up to the front. Um, Erica is the Deputy Law Librarian at Stanford Law, um, has been a strong player in helping get this national inventory of uh, legal materials off the ground. Uh, Tim Stanley uh, is the CEO of Justia, but he was previously the founder of Five Law, which as you know is one of the, the premier services that West uh, provides. Um, Tim has been active in putting information on, on the internet since uh, 93, I think, is when you started your operation, if not earlier. Five, five, five more previous, uh, yeah. So absolutely. Um, and so we've asked them to talk today about the National Inventory of Legal Materials to describe what it is, but also to focus particularly on the situation in California. Um, so Erica, I'll let you uh, take over. you got about 30 minutes, and then we're going to break for lunch. And so Tim, I assume you'll just pick up. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm Erica, I guess for purposes of that we're going. And uh, we just get started. So uh, California Chief Justice Ronald George recently wrote in the Golden Gate University Law Review, uh, we cannot afford to operate in an electronic tower of Babel. And even though Chief Justice George was only referring to California's court's case management system, the tower of Babel frustration, I think exists for anyone attempting to do legal research right now. Uh, many of the things that are uh, primary legal research materials are not freely available. What is free often carries a warning that it can't be relied upon, that it isn't official. Um, for every state, there are different vendor relationships when it comes to publishing the code and assertion of copyright. And kind of in our opinion, we think that the, uh, and I say our, if you good people at Stanford, uh, we feel that a lot of uh, the concept behind LawDuck might help with some of that confusion. So for LawDuck to work, uh, a group of librarians are really interested in helping form this national inventory of primary legal materials. We think it will really help kickstart a lot of the law that go, uh, initiative. And the inventory for what it's worth, the it, definition, it's going to be like a packing list. Uh, describing, detailing, cataloging, where you can find the laws of our federal and state systems, and then some. Uh, and when I say and then some, it's not just what we consider primary. We might want to note the availability of those things that are created along the way in that process. Things like briefs, hearings, things of that sort. Um, and for what it's worth, the definition I like to use for primary authority comes from Elise Fox's Legal Research Dictionary, and she just says that primary authority is the law itself, the authority that issues from one of the branches of federal, state, or local government as part of its function or issues from the Constitution. There are other definitions, but that was a nice, simple one. Uh, and at the first Law Act of event back in January at Stanford, uh, one of the big issues was, what about this national inventory? And we were really fortunate to have lots of local law librarians there from NoCal, the Northern California Association of Law Libraries. Lots of leadership, too, I should say, past, current, and former presidents, uh, and future presidents. And there was a lot of interest. And some of the questions that we were most interested in included, what should we include in this inventory? What type of content should we collect? Formats, et cetera, price. What form should it take? How do we know copyright issues? Uh, what about the IP issues regarding briefs um, and filings to the court, not produced by the court, but uh, submitted to? Um, how do we organize this effort? Is it done locally, statewide? Do we get WAWL to help um, legislative efforts and so on? And so we realized that for the inventory to really take hold, it would take a lot of effort across a lot of states with lots of volunteers. And Right then and there, the group of NoCal folks, the good NoCal folks, decided to form an informal group to start working on this problem. And our mission was to create a prototype of the national inventory, focusing on California resources specifically. Uh, after a few phone calls and chats and emails, we started a Google group to start talking about all this, and we decided to go with a very simple platform. Um, no one wanted to master new skills or develop the greatest database product ever for this. We just wanted content to reign in this realm. And uh, we figured after the inventory was created, we could leave it to technological innovation of someone else uh, to kind of make it better. Uh, so we went with a Google spreadsheet. There are better solutions perhaps, but that's what we went with because it's very easy to use, very easy to share, and very easy for us to manually edit, and a simple form can be generated for the spreadsheet. So if folks were not comfortable with a spreadsheet environment, they could just use a form and input data. Uh, and it was very easy to track changes, which has been very helpful when you have lots of different people defining data. Um, as with anything with a spreadsheet, um, you always have a real strong sense of hindsight, like, oh, I really should have done it that way. Um, we didn't. Uh, so we're learning. This is a learning process. Um, so for example, we didn't cluster cities under their counties, which would have been such a logical thing to do. We can clean it up later, but we're like, oh, we had this dumb moment. We're like, oh, that would have been so easy. Um, 
we didn't include a column for permanent public access, but we can include that going forward. Uh, I think probably one of the, the most biggest things we did include is uh, column for authenticated data. Carl has talked about this, and many of you all have also talked about this. And that probably leads back to that first meeting when one of our volunteers, Susan, who's here, famously kind of explained nothing in California is authentic. We don't even need to document it. So there's no problem for that. There's nothing that's authentic for a model. Um, and I don't know if she was just referring to the law, but nothing in California is authentic. Um, uh, anyway. Um, but there were fields that were important and relevant, and we started filling those up. And the key ones for us, at least kind of what we're seeing so far, are copyright assertion and language, disclaimers, official status, and price information. And that's somewhat tricky. Um, you know, we're still entering data, but we're seeing some interesting things, and we're sure some of these things will be mirrored in other states as we go along. And I just want to add a tidbit. Uh, I co-teach advanced legal research with Paul Lomeo at the law library, and sometimes we'll bring in our frustrations to the students about how much something costs, blah, blah, blah. Librarians like to complain about these things. And the students will politely kind of go like, oh, very interesting, thanks for sharing. Um, but we have started to actually use some what are called law.gov type assignments with our students. We're getting them to actually look, each student will get, we have 40 plus students, each student will get a state. And they're looking at the administrative codes and the state codes and um, all sorts of materials to see, are there copyright assertions? Is it official? How easy can you find it in bulk? And they're really surprised, and I think they're actually enjoying it. Um, and we can talk about some of the fun states at another time, but uh, they're, they're seeing some interesting things. Some of the things that we're seeing when we're doing this. Um, so for California, uh, one of the interesting bits, so there are about almost 540 municipalities and counties in the state of California, and uh, nearly 80% of them have outsourced their co uh, municipal and county codes to four commercial vendors. Almost all of them seem to be free online from what we've seen so far. However, over 40% claim to be unofficial and have disclaimers. Almost 50% have copyright assertions. And I think those numbers are actually going to go up as we keep fine-tuning the data. And this gets to uh, lots of folks with uh, different interpretations. Some things, if they don't say official, folks are uncomfortable saying, well, is it or isn't it? And so we have a lot of things with question marks or don't know, we'll come back to it. So I think that number could actually go up. Um, paper versions of many of these codes are also printed by the same publisher that produces it online. Um, not for free, I might add. And uh, a question of bulk access came up, and a good question, how easy it is to get bulk access? And the answer is nearly impossible. Uh, so we recently conducted a small sample of some of these municipalities, trying to cover the different commercial vendors. And none of them had bulk access available. Uh, the best, I guess the second best, or the movie prize on this one, was a, a PDF version. Not bulk access. Um, and that was for a few hundred dollars. So still, not, not the perfect world. Um, and getting price information on these things also is really tricky. Uh, even though I work at a major law library, most university law libraries, most county law libraries, may only have their local municipal codes available. They're not going to have all the state's codes. It's, that's not from this realm. And so we are limited to the price information individual volunteers might see. And calling each city in California is very time consuming and not always not all that uh, helpful in experience. Um, so I have a few good examples to share with you, and I'm not targeting anyone's hometown, if it is your hometown. Uh, so Laguna Beach looks like a nice place to go. Um, their municipal code is polished by Quality Code Publishing, and they produce about 90 of the state's municipal codes. The sites look almost identical, except for the uh, city logo. And this is the disclaimer that's on all of theirs. This electronic version is provided for information only and should not be considered the official version of the code. Please consult the official printed version before signing provisions of this code. If inconsistencies exist, da da da, please look at the official legislation. Well, so I was like, okay, how do I go to the official version? And I called the nice city clerk's office at Laguna Beach. Very nice woman spoke to me there. And she was like, well, it's online. I said, well, I want to see the official version. How do I do that? Oh, gee. Um, People haven't asked me about that in eons, because it's online for free. And so, well, how much is it? And she said, I'll have to get back to you. So a day, I mean, she, the woman was so nice, and she got back to me the next day. It was about $125, and she said to me, I haven't sold one in who knows when. And for what it's worth, that's, that was that example. Closer to home, San Jose. Um, American Legal Publishing uh, produces their municipal code. 43 of the state's codes are also produced by them. All of them also look just as, with the other example, the same. And they all have a copyright assertion at the bottom of the sites. And their disclaimer, similar to the other one, but I'll just share with you, this code of ordinances and or other documents that appear on this site may not reflect the most current legislation adopted by the municipality. American Legal Publishing provides these documents for informational purposes only. Well, great. 
Um, these documents should not be relied upon as the definitive authority for local legislation. Uh, additionally, the formatting and pagination of the posted documents varies from the formatting of the official copy. Um, the official printed copy of code of ordinances should be consulted prior to any action being taken. So if I did want to consult the official version, uh, it would cost me about $300 plus $150 a year for updates. Um, and one of our volunteers actually called American Legal Publishing and asked them about the copyright assertion on the bottom of the screen, and they didn't really have an answer. So we'll get back to you. We still haven't heard back from the college mm -hmm. um, And uh, this actually got a few volunteers talking, uh, because we all are li librarians. When do you ever see li uh, disclaimers like this in books? And certainly, uh, printed materials of uh, printed materials and primary materials have mistakes in them all the time. And any librarian here has gotten the notices uh, of replacement pages, the self-adhesive correction sheets, you slap in the book. Um, but something about the web keeps prompting these disclaimers, like you cannot rely on the material again and again. Um, you're going to forgive me, I'm going to give a few more quick examples because they're good. Uh, the Office of Attorney General, we went to their site to look for the opinions. And uh, they have a really interesting one, this disclaimer. Disclaimer of duty to continue provision of the data. Due, I know this, due to the dynamic nature of the internet, resources that are freely and public avail publicly available one day may require a fee or restrict access the next. And the location of items may change as menus, home pages, and files are reorganized by the, by the internet. Um, user agrees <laughs> that the, the use of the Attorney General's homepage is at the user's sole risk. Um, <laughs> And they cannot guarantee that it will be error free. Uh, so I guess if you want it to be error free, and uh, I guess due to, uh, we like to say, the dynamic nature of print, uh, if you want to buy it, it's about $400. Okay. Um, and we've mentioned the California Supreme Court and uh, their contract and the appellate uh, court, uh, decisions, uh, which is contracted with Lexis. Um, but I want to share kind of a bit of the language from the over 2,500 word uh, license agreement that you have to get through to read the material. Um, it's saying that there is no charge, no copyright on the opinion text, but the text, the page is limited to personal use, uh, and see the lengthy publisher's limitations on use. The official report summaries and headnotes are subject to copyright, are not included in this site. The official reports page, and this is the best part, is primarily intended to provide effective public access to all California's presidential appellate decisions. It is not intended to function as an alternative to commercial computer-based services, and products for comprehensive legal research, such as Lexus, who produces the service. Um, and this actually, when we talked about this with our students, uh, one of our law students came up to us after class and said, would, I be, would it be malpractice to use this site? And that's an excellent question. Um, one good copyright example I want to share with you, uh, the California Civil Jury Instructions. This is also similar with the Criminal Jury Instructions. Uh, produced by the Judicial Council of California. This one is freely available in official form on their website, but it had some interesting copyright language. So it says on the online version and in the paper, it's identical. Uh, copyright 2010 by the Judicial Council of California, all rights reserved. No copyright is claimed by the Judicial Council to the table of contents, table of statutes, table of cases, index, or table of related instructions. And below that, 2010, Matthew Bender and Company, a member of the LexisNexis group, no copyright is claimed to the text of the jury instructions and verdict forms, directions for use, sources and authority, and, or other advisory committee commentary, user's guide, life expectancy tables, which were shrinking for us as we were reading this, or a disposition <laughs> table. And the paper version is identical. What's interesting is even though Matthew Bender is the official uh, kind of a contract for this, uh, Westlaw, who produces an unofficial version of this, has the same copyright language, just substituted in Westlaw for Matthew Bender. And this was a difficult one for us in our spreadsheet for like check marks, like what do we put down for this? And, um, and a recent example just came up, a patron came by the library and was using some public utility commission materials. And they are all on the web, but this is an interesting nuance we hadn't even thought about. I was mentioning this to Susan just now. Your page numbers on any of the materials. This patron is a local attorney, wants to cite it in briefs. The online version is useless to her. She said there are no paragraph numbers, so it's really difficult, and she had to find a paper version of the library, which is what brought her to our library. And, uh, and th those are some of the challenges that we're facing is kind of getting consistency in definitions, getting and keeping volunteers. We're lucky to have over 20, but it's keeping them going. It's, it's always an important piece. And the price information we're dealing with is a moving target. Every library and every librarian here knows that price relationships with vendors vary. So the price I might have might be different than the price you know, uh, Susan might have and from a county library and so on. So we're just kind of taking a stab. What price information we have, we're going to put in there, but it's not perfect and we know that. Um, and 
I think looking ahead, the really great thing is AALL, the American Association of Law Libraries, is behind this process. And as of this moment, besides the California inventory, which is alive and well, uh, there is, I think there's seven working groups right now that are currently starting on their projects. And they're kind of random individuals who are actually doing little bits and pieces in their states. And so that I think that's, there's some good momentum on it, and hopefully we can kind of generate some more uh, interest. All right, yeah, so I'll sort of follow up with some of the stuff uh, Erica was covering on. Um, just uh, uh, some additional things uh, about the, the stuff in California as well as in the U.S. is that a lot of times that the state government will put up things, but they don't really do the, the full job. Of it. And so, for example, we talked a bit about the Oregon Code and the headings and things like that the uh, Oregon uh, uh, sort of, uh, state government was claiming copyright on. If you go to the Legislative Council and you go to the California Code, you don't even have the headings. They actually strip those out. So one way to keep people from copying those is just not to put them up for free. And I'm surprised that this has happened in California, which has had the code up for a number of years, but it's, uh, uh, it's the way it is right now. And you can't, you know, if you look through different uh, administrative agencies sometimes, they might have a section of codes that uh, relate to their agency. So sometimes you can find those headings. I know uh, Rob, uh, who does the Oregon Law Sites, we look at this for California as well. Uh, but it's, it's gonna be quite a bit of work, and they just didn't put it up. Uh, so that's uh, you know sort of one thing to note. But the other thing is that as the national inventory is sort of going through and getting done, a lot of the stuff that's out there on the web right now is not on Lexis or West. So you know Lexis and West have a lot of things up there, certainly on the case law, the statutes, and the codes on the state level and federal level. Uh, but they're not they don't all the cities. I mean this is sort of a hodgepodge of uh, different uh, sort of regulations, regulations and code sections. And so I think a large part, you know, if you're an average person, you know, and you're just looking at law in your everyday life, you certainly got some state things you need to focus on to make sure you do my driver's license, items like that. But other items like, you know, landlord tenants or, uh, you know, whether something's rent controlled or not rent controlled, you know, everyday life types of things, it's often at the uh, uh, city level. Uh, even, you know, small things like, you know, well, how can I fight my parking ticket or something like that. So. There's a, a lot of stuff that I think it impacts everyday people that's, that's at the city level, which has not been available on the Western Watches, nor have everyday people tend to go there, the Western Watches anyways, where I, I think the, the city governments and the county governments have done a great job in getting this stuff up and writing contracts that require this stuff to be online for free. Uh, so that, that's one, you know, that's one sort of core thing I think is if you look at the internet. The actual amount of content, you know, legal content that's out there is incredibly high. Uh, as I sort of look through, you know, sort of dealing with the, the, the different state governments, I think one of the big things that I, you know, I think that we want to work on is not just sort of get things involved so that we can download it or you know, get it everywhere for download, uh, which is fine. Uh, but I think it's also to help the, the state governments or the, the county or the city governments publish this stuff themselves. So while I think it's good that we find what's out there, what's missing, uh, a secondary part of this, we sort of find the best practices, finding who's doing a good job of it, and get these guys in communication with each other so they can actually use some of the tools and share the tools across different governments. And ideally, you know, at some point, especially with some of the, the tech people uh, that uh, Carl's put together, and uh, Tom Bruce and some of the guys at Cornell and some of these other places, uh, get some open source publishing tools and some open source uh, or, or sort of open uh, citation systems, which are consistent across many different sort of levels of government. And I realize, you know, this might take a long, long time to do, but we do have a lot of good tech people that are very interested in this right now. And they've shown a good ability to really, uh, you know, program their all very, very pro-free law, and getting things out for free. And they'll be more than happy to provide these tools and stuff to the government, even help train them, even help set them up with different types of servers and things. So, you know, I think there's, you know, lots of work finding out what's there and what's not there, but also, uh, going through there and then trying to get these different uh, uh, government agent, government entities sort of connected with each other to use the best practices. Um, the other thing I wanted to quickly mention was just sort of, I want to run through the California case law just sort of as an example, mainly because uh, I went through the contract that Lexus had with the state of California and it just came for an RFP. Uh, just to sort of went through a, a few items here. Um, the first thing, you know, if you go, if you look at the, uh, the California case law online, the, the stuff that's provided by Lexus, sort of the archive back to, uh, is Cal one or just mm -hmm. California reports in this they, they do have to provide it online for free. So that was part of the contract. Uh, and that part was there. That's basically all it says. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say you have to do anything else other than provide for free. They could put more licensing restrictions or whatever else they want to in front of it. The, uh, the goal, I think, of the, uh, the California court system 
was at least allow the public to be able to read a case if they want to read a case. Uh, but beyond that, there's not a lot there. No internal page numbers. Uh, they're there. Uh, head notes. So th this contract with uh, Lexus, as, as well as the one that's you know just I guess the RFP closed uh, a couple weeks ago, but uh, we'll see if Lexus gets again. But or it might be West or maybe Fast Case or Wolf's Clear. Uh, you know, depending who gets it. But the head notes uh, are required to be written as part of the contract. The per the the company like Lexus that writes the head notes, they get to keep copyrighting those head notes in some of the other classification schemes. So that's kept by Lexus. But they have to give a license back to the state of California so that the state of California can use it in future editions of their code. So basically, if Lexus doesn't win this next you know, round about the contract, the next publisher uh, of the, the official version of the California code does, in fact, can in fact publish out the, uh, the head notes that were written by Lexus by way of the, the California government. Uh, but that said, those head notes and those classification schemes are not showing up on the free site that they're putting up on uh, you know, Lexus, Nexus, or Lexus dash Nexus, depending on how you have your cookie set, uh, uh, .com. So it's a, this is one sort of item. And I think it would not be too hard for the California government to require ownership of those uh, uh, you know, head notes and things like that, I, I believe, since they're basically going to be providing them anyway, so for free. And the only real control over them from Lexus standpoint, I guess, is they don't get off to everyone, but they guess they somehow keep them off the, the free system while they're running, running the, the site, the free site themselves. Uh, so that might be one thing to think of. Uh, the other item, I, I think for, from a Lexus standpoint, because they, they don't really get any money from becoming an official publisher. What they really get is a large marketing benefit. They get the subscriber list of previous people that subscribe to the official code uh, in terms of CD or uh, book uh, publications, or if they want to sell them, you move them on the online system. So in that subscriber list, has to be provided by the previous, uh, you know, previous uh, uh, entity that was actually producing the official version. So there's some real marketing value in there in terms of getting a subscriber list, and you're the official publisher. And there's really something to be said when you're the official publisher of the code. And you know, I, mean, I think there's probably you know, two companies that have you know very strong brands here. I think West, uh, you know, Thomson Reuters West has a very strong brand in terms of what they do, and I think Lexus Nexus does. But you know, someone let's say like Fast Case came and got a hold of California. Cases, you know, that would give them a very strong branding uh, proposition to be able to say, "Hey, we're the official one." So that's that, that's one uh, a huge item, and I'm pretty sure that's why Lexus probably wants to really get this contract. Uh, I have an idea what was going on with West, but I'm not allowed to say it. <laughs> but, uh, I was there at the time when this happened uh, for a very brief period. Of time. Um, so, I mean, there, there there's some real uh, benefits on that. And then, you know, as far as the cases themselves go, just in terms of California. The, the cases right now, basically, since uh, uh, Cal Second are up online for free. So, I know here, LegalNet has them, uh, Final has them, there's some other folks, I'm sure Google's going to have them up relatively soon as well. Uh, so, those, those are out and about. Um, so, for, for California, I think it, it's, it's pretty much out there. And that's with internal page numbers and everything else. But you still would like to go back and sort of get these uh, previous cases. So, maybe a clinic or something, I don't know, we might be interested in a yeah. test case for it, <laughs> maybe uh, not that. Certainly, a possibility, but I would like to see some sort of uh, some sort of litigation or some sort of uh, something to sort of clarify some of these legal issues. Um, so, anyway, so that was the main item I wanted to, to, to point out on the, the California cases. It's, it is up for review right now. Um, I obviously, I don't know who's going to get it, but it's something where you know, sort of the corpus sort of passes from entity to entity. It's just that Lexus made a choice not to put it all on. It doesn't mean that if Fast Case or Walter Kluwer's got it, that, that they couldn't actually put it out, as well as the head notes and things like that. So, awesome. so um, I, I wanted to add two points on the California inventory. Uh, for the state court system, it's, it's really quite interesting because as part of the click-through license agreement to access the full court opinions of California, um, you click through an agreement that says this is for personal use only, and it explicitly excludes public and nonprofit uses. Um, from the use of those materials. As far as the Attorney General opinions, um, I actually about six months ago sent a note to the Attorney General's office saying I would like to put all the Attorney General opinions online um, and make them available. I received a note back from the Attorney General's office saying well you will need to send us a proposal to get our permission. Um, I at that point took all the Attorney General opinions that were visible on the internet and made a copy of those. Um, and sent the note back saying, you know, guess what, I got a lot of them and they're available for $67 on Lulu, uh, which is less than the $2,500 official Attorney General payments. 
And the case was referred to a deputy attorney general. Uh, they've conducted a legal review. And for several months now, we've been asking them to make a decision on whether we're able to actually get the rest of the attorney general opinions and make them available to the public for free. Um, and so we're still waiting. We have not sued or threatened to sue or do any legal actions. Um, the attorney general is not only the chief legal officer of California, He's an elected official, and so we're hoping that perhaps that, that part of his personality will make him want to make the information available. Um, so I want to do, uh, thank Erica for starting off this national legal inventory. Um, you have postcards in front of you, uh, one for each of the different states. Uh, we also made some very nice plane cards um, that we got from Luke, uh, which you can give out to your various volunteers. Um, I also made us another copy um, to give to Roberta Schaefer to donate to the Law Library of Congress um, so that we have a copy of that um, in perpetuity. Um, so. <laughs>